Welcome to the U Church of Tarpon Springs. We're glad that you joined us today. To those who are finding us for the first time, welcome. And thank you for being with us. My name is Kathy Hopkins. I'm your worship associate today. I've been here for 10 years. This is the first time I've ever been worship associate. So I'll see, I'll see how easy or hard it is. <laughs> I go by the pronouns she and her. And for those of you who may be visually challenged, I'm an older white woman of medium height and weight with gray-brown hair that I wear, usually tucked behind my ears. Again, we offer a warm welcome to all who are with us today. I see some faces I haven't seen for a while, so welcome back to those of you. It's good to have you with us. If you have been lonely, hurt, afraid, or exhausted, here you will find reprieve and companionship. If your spirit is bruised by the terrible news of the week, especially this week with what we've been hearing from Israel, here you will find solace. If you seek to understand, here you will, you will be encouraged in your search. New pathways will be lit for you and wherever your journeys take you, you will know that you can always come home again to this place made sacred by our love. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe in the worth and dignity of every human being. Each person on earth has an equal claim to life, liberty, and justice, and no idea, ideal, or philosophy is superior to a single human life. As a congregation, we seek to create a diverse and accepting community based on the principles of our faith, Unitarian Universalism, and we are drawn together in voluntary loyalty. If you're new to us and want more information about UUCTS, please fill out both sides of the card in the pew in front of you. And also we have, uh, if you have a joy or concern, there's a smaller card where you can write it down and I'll read it for you if you like. Our special guest musician today is Tim Burnman. He's filling in for Bonnie, who is taking a rare vacation this week. And he will lead the first hymn, um, number 101 in the Gray Book, Abide With Me. Abide with me fast falls the evening tide the darkness deepens still with me abide when other helpers fail to comfort flee help of the helpless all abide with me Swift to the close helps out life's little days. Earth with limits, glories pass away. Change and decay, yet all around I see. We appreciate the calming beauty of the Ennis paintings every Sunday, but how much do we really know about the history behind them? In today's service, we'll step back in time to hear the poetry and scriptures that inspired the artist 
and experience music from the original dedication service almost a hundred years ago. So what meaning can we carry forward from these gifts of the past? Our guest speaker today is Lynn Whitelaw. Lynn served as the founding director and curator for the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art and is a scholar of the artist George Ennis, Jr. Now retired, Lynn teaches classes and is a frequent speaker for the Eckerd College Ollie Program and the City of Tarpon Springs Heritage Series. He leads a very interesting life. In fact, he just got back from a, a trip in Canada, uh, and he always has interesting things to, to talk about. Lynn has spoken at our church on numerous occasions, and we're honored to have him speak to us today as we explore the spiritual theme of heritage this month. All right, this is another first for me. We now light our chalice. We light this chalice to find inner peace, love for each other, and faith in ourselves. Also, to be welcoming to whomever we meet and kind to all living creatures. So gather around this light of hope as we share this time together. We will now sing Spirit of Life, number 123 in the gray hymnal, followed by a poetry reading by our friend Elaine Brooks. holy temple. So as I read this poem, I encourage you to look at the painting and see how these words inspired it. There were two words in here, because this was written by William Cullen Bryant in 1824. So it took me a few tries to get through this poem, because it's not what I'm used to reading. But there were two words that I had to look up, and one is architrave, and that is a molding around a doorway or a window. So when you hear it in the poem, you will see how it inspired this painting, part of this painting. And the other one is a very simple word called, it's stilly, which means calm. So when you hear those words, you'll know what they mean. So this is a forest hymn by William Cullen Bryant. The groves were God's first temples. Ere men learned to hew the shaft and lay the architrave, and spread the roof above them, ere he framed the lofty vault to gather and roll back the sound of anthems in the dark wood. Amidst the cool and silence, he knelt down and offered to the mightiest solemn thanks and supplication, for his simple heart might not resist the sacred influences, which from the stilly twilight of the place and from the gray old trunks that high in heaven mingled their mossy boughs, 
and from the sound of the invisible breath that swayed at once all their green tops stole over him and bowed his spirit with the thought of boundless power and inaccessible majesty. Ah, why should we, in the world's riper years, neglect God's ancient sanctuaries and adore only among the crowd and <coughs> under roofs that our frail hands have raised? Let me, at least, here in the shadow of this aged wood, offer one hymn. Thrice happy if it finds acceptance in his ear. Thank you. For our children who are not here today, um, we, we, we will light this candle for all the children in the world and for all the children in our community who might not be here today. Okay. Okay. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. One more time. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the love of God surround you. We are a free faith and we must sustain ourselves financially. Please place your offerings in the plate as it is passed around, or you may mail it to 57 Reed Street, Tarpon Springs, or donate online at uutarpon.org. The offering will now be given and received. As we enter a moment of silence, let's contemplate this space where a hundred years ago, Julia and George Ennis sat in these very pews. What solace did they find here? What solace may we find today? And what will our gifts for the, be for the future, for people we will never know? Let our spirits be still.
from now, Lynn Whitelaw. Good morning and welcome to fall. I think it's fall. <laughs> the scripture readings for today are all related to George Innes Jr. and the paintings in this church. The reading is for the, the first reading is for the triptych at the back of the church called Promise, Realization, and Fulfillment. Um, the Old Testament scriptures were all selected by his wife, uh, Julia, and they are inscribed in the frames under each painting. For Promise, which is on the left, which represents the season of spring, she selected from Genesis chapter 9, verse 17, and God said, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh that is upon the earth. For Realization, which is the center panel and represents summer, the path of the just is the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. This was taken from Proverbs uh, chapter 4, verse 18. And for fulfillment, which is on the right, representing fall and the harvest, uh, from Leviticus chapter 25, verse 19, and the land shall yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fill and dwell in safety. For the altar triptych in the chancel behind me, Innes entitled his three panels, He Leadeth Me in Green Pastures and Beside Still Water. These words were taken from the 23rd Psalm of David called the Shepherd Psalm. Innes selected this because the church in the 1920s was called the Church of the Good Shepherd. This most familiar of all the Psalms reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. <clears throat> thy rod and thy staff, thy comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And lastly, <clears throat> for the painting to my left, which was Innes' last painting, he chose several 19th century literary sources, including the forest hymn that we heard of William Cullen Bryant. But for his biblical selection, Innes chose from the book of Habuku, who was one of the minor prophets from the late 7th century BC, who is represented in the Old Testament who wrote in chapter 2, verse 20, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want The Lord is my shepherd There is nothing I shall want The Lord is my shepherd I shall not want In verdant pasture God gives me repose Beside restful water God leads me And refreshes my soul the Lord is my shepherd, I has nothing I shall want. Please join in if you would like. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. I'm guided in right paths for God's name, even though I walk 
Through the dark valley I feel no evil For you are at my side with your rod and your staff You give me courage, the Lord is my shepherd There is nothing I shall want The Lord is my shepherd There is nothing I shall want you spread the table before me in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want Only goodness and kindness follow me All the days of my life And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord For years to come The Lord is my shepherd There is nothing I shall want the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you I am honored to be here today to speak to you about the George Ennis Jr. paintings in the church. Uh, the theme for this month for the church is the word heritage, and it is a fitting topic uh, for my talk. We all know the famous quote by the Spanish-American philosopher George Santayana, who in 1905, his work, The Life of Reason, stated, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. It is his belief that if our world is going to make progress, it needs to remember what it has learned, to understand that change is not the same thing as progress. The word heritage is a noun defined as something that is transmitted and becomes inherited. This inheritance can be a legacy if it is honored with stewardship. What I would like my message today reflect is on the historical perspective an important chapter of the life of this church between 1918 and 1927 when the vision of this congregation and the philanthropy of George Ennis Jr. and his wife Julia enriched the, this church with an arts legacy. <clears throat> to begin, we start with the date September 28, 1918 when a tornado-type storm hit Tarpon Springs and blew out the windows in this church. Because America was engaged in the conflict of the Great War, which we call World War I, materials like glass and craftsmanship to restore the sanctuary were difficult to come up with, <clears throat> so the spaces were walled up. In perspective, the Great War was a devastating global event about global, about political instability that resulted in the shock of total warfare unlike the world had previously known. <clears throat> On September 28th, as the storm came through Tarpon Springs, 1,200,000 U.S. troops were at the Battle of Mousse Argon in the fields of Paris, where successfully they were cutting the supply lines of the Germans thus forcing a withdrawal and marking the final turning point in the war. Forty-five days later, on November 11th, an armistice was signed, which today we celebrate as Veterans Day. Against this background, we turn our attention to George Innes, Jr. He was born in France in 1854. <clears throat> he became a talented, award-winning artist in the French salons in the late 1890s. He was the son of George Ennis, 
who had wintered in Tarpon Springs towards the end of his life between 1890 and 1894. And his father was uh, at the height of his fame uh, as part of the second generation of the Hudson River School. And he was considered at that time America's greatest landscape artist. George Ennis Jr. Was, had the curse of Jr. after his name. He was not the stereotype of the starving artist. In 1879, he became extremely wealthy when he married uh, Julia Goodrich Roswell Smith, a uh, socialite from New York City. And he also, in, after 1895, inherited the wealth of his father's estate. This caused a personal struggle for him to gain any recognition as a serious artist. He would become a prominent member of the late Gilded Age elite with homes in, Mon in Manhattan, Montclair, uh, New Jersey, a summer estate in Craigsmoor on the ridge of the Hudson River Valley, as well as a winter residence on West Orange Street, just blocks from here in Tarpon, uh, which from 1902 to 1926, he expanded and even established an artist colony on the property. He also built a studio and a cottage on the Ancloat River about six miles north of Tarpon Springs called Camp Comfort. Ennis was a devout universalist and a long-term member of this church. He was the head of the building committee for the 1908 church that we are in today, and he's also a major funder. In 1918, after the storm, Ennis agreed to paint a triptych to replace the windows, because Julia, Julia told him to. Uh, the result, the triptych located behind at the back of the sanctuary, promise realization fulfillment, was installed in 1920 with scriptures selected by Julia. When you study this triptych and the five other paintings in the sanctuary that George Jr., uh, George Ennis Jr. created before his death in 1926, one marvels at the beauty and the message of these works. Collectively, what do they tell us about the artist and his aesthetic? First, the paintings are not traditional religious art. There is no medievalist images or iconography, no apostles or saints, no Christ on the cross, no Virgin Mary to venerate in front of. Instead, we are presented with a series of spiritual paintings that reflect Innes' belief in the divine relationship between man and nature, in which the primary symbol of God is expressed through light. Some of this stems from Innes' universalist beliefs, some comes from a 19th century transcendentalist movement with the supremacy of nature with a capital N. And aesthetically, much of it is from the influence of the Barbizon School of Landscape Painting that Innes had emulated in France. In this church, these works have become a pantheon, a repository of paintings by George Innes Jr. and his desire to leave for all of us, a lasting message. On January 26, 1924, Innes unveiled a second triptych for the church's chancel, the paintings behind me, and based on the 23rd Psalm. These were painted at Innes's Camp Comfort Studio, located on the Ancloat River. They are a meditative complement to promise, realization, and fulfillment and continue the soft edge, tonalist style, mystical light, and signature coloration, often referred to as in a screen. <laughs> because these paintings and the other two in this sanctuary were all done in the 1920s, uh, let's take a look at that era. And in uh, about two weeks, the uh, Tampa Bay History Center opens up a major exhibit of Florida, the, the decade of the 1920s. So it's worth going to see. Uh, we refer to this decade as the Roaring Twenties. Following World War I, 
<clears throat> the global impact of the Spanish flu, something we thought we would never see again, the legislation of the effects of prohibition, the 1920 ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution giving women the right to vote, and a new economic prosperity combined with a love for modernity were to cause huge changes in the social and cultural life of America and uh, in the fabric of American society. Now, automobiles, electricity, telephones, indoor plumbing, radios were viewed as new essential needs of modern life. By 1924, over two and a half million radios were in homes, and President Calvin Coolidge used the new technology to deliver the first nationwide radio transmission. <clears throat> Additionally, modernism would um, influence mass culture. In art, from Cubism to Art Deco, in music, from jazz to Gershwin, and in a, a new mass media film, the silent film, uh, were also to have an effect. And one of those films, Bitter Fruit, was actually filmed at Innes' Camp Comfort uh, property. And lastly, changes in fashion, such as the flapper dress, were to define the new modern woman. For George Innes Jr., who was a trustee of the Century Publishing Company in New York City, owned by his father-in-law, he often used his position as an editor, illustrator, and writer of op-eds to comment on his concerns about modern society. Today, we refer to Innes intellectually as an anti-modernist, which is not a pejorative um, and does not mean that he was not progressive. Like the American arts and crafts movement, he believed in the value of traditions in a modern world and adherence to old world craftsmanship against machine age mass production. Innes had a great respect for the past and worried that the good of those qualities were too quickly being forgotten. What we see here before us today, these paintings, now some 100 years old and many approaching 100 years in age, is what Innes Jr. believed true art should be, that it should transcend current trends and find a way to be relevant both in the present and for the future. Innes wanted his art to convey a sublime expression of spiritual timelessness, and he did not include historical references that might date the work. This was, in a, in a sense, a kind of a modern idea. The years 1924 and 25 marked the pinnacle of George Innes' artistic career and the notoriety, particularly for the painting to my right here, entitled The Only Hope, which became one of the most celebrated paintings of the, of the mid-1920s, and it was designed as a mystical, cautionary tale. The Only Hope is a commentary following the devastation of World War I on the follies of wrong thinking. Painted at Innes' summer studio in Craigsmoor, New York, the only hope was then shipped down to Tarpon, where it was unveiled in this church, and crowds came to marvel at its imagery and to read an enigmatic narrative program Innes wrote to accompany the painting. The only hope next went on tour to cities and educational institutions around the country actually sponsored by the Tarpon Springs Chamber of Commerce. In St. Petersburg, for example, hundreds lined up daily to see it in the ballroom of the Sereno Hotel. In Lakeland, it was shown at Florida Methodist College, today Florida Southern, where journalist and publisher Edward W. Bach, of Bach Tower fame, <clears throat> was totally memorized by it. 
offered him $100,000 to buy it, and he was going to tour it around as part of a peace initiative, but Innes declined. When President Calvin Coolidge saw it in the nation's capital, he became transfixed and lobbied to have it permanently displayed in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. Innes again declined, saying he had painted it for his little church in Tarpon Springs, and that is where he wanted it to remain. The Only Hope continued its tour, <clears throat> was written about in newspapers, was reproduced in magazines, but ultimately became a cause celebre and a victim of the fadism of the 1920s. But that is a future story. Following the tour, uh, Ennis had the only hope reinstalled in Tarpon Springs. Understanding the church had become a repository for his work, at age 72, he began a companion piece for the sanctuary. The Lord is in his holy temple on my left, completed just days before he died on July 27, 1926, was his final act of spiritual philanthropy. The large landscapes brings us in close view to a grove of trees to express nature as God's true sanctuary. He acknowledged biblical scriptures and the literary sources we heard of today. The legacy of George Innes Jr. after his death was kept alive through his widow, Julia, who continued to attend this church until her last winter in Tarpon Springs in 1939. Understanding the Church of the Good Shepherd had become a pantheon of her husband's work, she had two earlier award-winning religious paintings, The Centurion and The Last Shadow of the Cross, that Innes had painted in France and had hung in the Louvre, now shipped to Tarpon Springs. She next provided the financial support to have the church expanded to accommodate the paintings as a shrine to the philanthropy of her family and the spiritual journey of her husband. <clears throat> Two services took place in 1927 to finalize this effort. On Sunday, January 9th, a dedication of Innes's last painting, The Lord is in His Holy Temple, took place recognizing also the anniversary of his birth. The long-term minister, Reverend Louis J. Richards, a close personal friend of the family and author of a book on George Innes uh, Jr., officiated. And then on Sunday, February 20th, 1927, with great public uh, publicity and news coverage, uh, another set of services took place at 11 a.m., at 2.30 p.m., and at 7.30 p.m. To, for the dedication of the remodeled church, the reinstallation of the Innes paintings, and for the new parish hall. Despite that Innes was deceased, this day was a hallmark for his art and for his life story. Following the services, luncheons and receptions took place at the Tarpon Inn, a mere three-block walk from the church. The Tarpon Inn on Spring Bayou had all the modern luxuries and was considered one of the best resort hotels on the west coast of Florida and was the center of social life in Tarpon Springs. On March 4, 1927, just 12 days after the rededication of the church, the six-story wood frame Tarpon Inn burnt to the ground. With the collapse of the Florida real estate boom in 1926, the great stock market crash in 1929, the Roaring Twenties was brought to an end. It also ushered in a major period of decline for Tarpon Springs, which included a blight of the sponge beds in the Gulf of Mexico, thus further affecting the local economy. The only bright spot for the city was when former President Calvin Coolidge came to Tarpon Springs on January 10, 1930 to speak 
and he came to see the George Innes Jr. paintings. After World War II and into the 1970s, tourism became a greater contributor to the city of Tarpon Springs economy. The Church of the Good Shepherd would become a major destination for art lovers and for those who had heard of George Innes Jr. and his artistic and spiritual legacy. The church expanded to accommodate the numbers uh, that came to attend, and we, the church was uh, in signs that were up, sponge docks, Innes paintings, and they are still that way today. Um, where was that? The church expanded, and the others came, and I want to commend the church as being such great stewards of the Innes paintings over the years, maintaining their necessary care, having them conserved in the early 1980s, and most recently properly stored and treated while the church went through a six-year restoration project. For over 100 years, the windows in this church were closed off and the sanctuary often felt like a mausoleum. Today, these beautiful arched windows and the warm amber tone, wood tones in the church bring more than a natural light into the sanctuary. They also illuminate a new era on George Innes Jr.'s paintings. And I know that George would be pleased that we gathered here today to take such close look at his paintings and legacy. Art can serve as a physical and historical reminder of the past. It can create a collective pride to share and treasure now and for the future. Let the Innes paintings in this church become a symbol of that heritage. As Innes uh, said of his art, all that I pray for, excuse me, all that I work for, all that I hope for, all that I pray for in my art is that I am able to arouse a spiritual emotion. What I would say is let it be so, and let the legacy of this art continue to inspire and bless this church with its heritage. Thank you. For our closing hymn, we were going to sing, um, it's number 115 in the gray hymnal, God of Grace. One 
Because of those who came before us, we are. In spite of their failings, we believe. Because of them, and in spite of the horizons of their vision, we too dream. Let us go remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to love mightily, to bow to the mystery. And my life is growing because I choose love. Let love be present, it's what we're made of. I choose love. We are a part of each other. We are one. One tie that binds us that can't be undone. I choose love. Peace for our planet is growing because I choose love. Let love be present, it's what we're made of. I choose love. We are a part of each other, we are one, one choice unites us, let this be the one, I choose love, I choose love, I choose love. We hope you found meaning in today's service. We close with these words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. So now's the time to 